you know, some of us uh, don't have our fathers here with us anymore. They've gone on to glory. Other, you know, other people uh, maybe weren't raised with their father or there's some situation going on. And, and so, you know, maybe it's not the happiest time for you. But you need to understand you have a heavenly father who loves you. Amen? A heavenly father who loves you and a heavenly father who will never leave you nor forsake you. He'll always be there for you. And you could take that to the bank and you could cash that. We serve a good God. Amen? And although we're celebrating Father's Day today, I thought, you know, we'd kind of take a look at, uh, you know, one of the great fathers of the faith. His name was Abraham. And the Bible shares so many stories about Father Abraham in the book of Genesis and even in the New Testament he's referenced. But we can learn a lot from Abraham. But I want you to understand that, you know, Abraham hadn't always been the father of the faith or like the Bible calls him, a friend of God. You know, that's so interesting that the Bible refers to Abraham as a friend of God. But it hadn't always been like that. And I'm going to show you that, you know, he too had some obstacles that he had overcome in his relationship with the Lord. Let's go over to Genesis chapter 12. Easy scripture to find. First book in the Bible here, Genesis chapter 12. But before we go to chapter 12, let's go up to chapter 11, verse 31. And look at what the word says. And Terah took his son Abram. Now remember, before Abraham was called Abraham, his name was Abram. Just like Sarah, her name was Sarai. Remember how God changed their name? Because there was a character change. And that's why God changed their name. So here Abraham is known as Abram, right? And so Terah, who was his father, took his son, Abram. Let me back up. Then Abram, I'm all over the place, ain't I? <laughs> Give me a second. Okay, here we go. And Terah took his son, Abram, and his grandson, Lot, the son of Haran, and his daughter-in-law, Sarai, his son Abram's wife, and they went out with them from Ur of the Chaldeans to go into the land of Canaan, and they came to Haran, and they dwelt there. Okay? So we're taking a look at Abraham this morning. You see him being referenced as Abram, right? And what I want you to see this morning is that Abraham and his family, his father, they actually resided, right? They actually resided in this area called Ur of the Chaldeans, or the Chaldees. And what you need to understand is that these people and this area, they didn't worship, you know, our Heavenly Father, okay? They had all kinds of crazy belief systems. And this area was known to basically worship a deity named Nanar, the moon god. The whole city was actually devoted to this moon god. And this is where Abraham was with his family, and this is their surroundings. This is where they were at. And yet, we see God start to move and do something, and we'll, we'll get there in a little bit. But I want to show you something here in chapter 12, verse 1. Look at what the word says. Now the Lord God, or the Lord said, had said to Abram, Get out of your country from your family and from your father's house to a land that I will show you. You see that? Isn't it interesting that God is telling Abraham to get out of his country? He's telling him to get away from his family and from his father's house. See, so, sometimes those may be the things that are holding you back from moving forward. It's unfortunate, but it's true. Now, what I want to show you is when he's saying, get out of your country. In other words, get out of the area that he's basically living in. Because remember, Israel was not a country yet at this time. 
right? Although Abraham was going to be the patriarch, he was going to be the, found, the father of this country. It had not been established yet. But yet God is telling him to get out of the country. Hold your places there and let's go to Joshua. We're going to go to chapter 24 and, and take a closer look at where they were at at this time. Let's keep going forward a little bit and you'll hit Joshua. Right before or right after Deuteronomy. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua. And we're going to go here to chapter 24. Joshua chapter 24. And we're going to take a look here at verse 2. And look at what the word says. And Joshua said to all the people, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, Your fathers, including Terah, Remember that was Abraham's father. The father of Abraham and the father of Nahor dwelt on the other side of the river in old times and they served other gods. You see that? They served other gods. So now, getting back to where we were in Genesis 12, 1, God is speaking to Abraham and he's telling him to get out of his country. So in other words, what he's telling him is, you need to get away from here. See, because sometimes in life, we're in a place that that's the very thing that's holding us back is our environment, where we're at. Now you may say, well, pastor, it's not so easy to, to relocate. Now I understand that. Stay, stay with me here. What I'm trying to illustrate to you and show you is that sometimes our environment can be the very thing that is holding us back and, and stopping us from going forward. And in the case here of Abraham, that's what was happening. He was in a place that was not good for him, and therefore God tells him, you need to move on. You need to get out of there. But see, God takes it even a step further, and he tells him, and get away from your family. Now, I know that could be a touchy subject, right? I know some of us, wouldn't have a problem with that, right? Saying, oh, get away from my family. You're saying, I could check that one off. I don't have a problem with that one. Others, maybe uh, family's not an issue, right? Maybe family isn't holding you back. Family's not bringing you down. But for other people, maybe it is. Maybe the family is the ones that are behind holding you back from moving forward and chasing after your dreams or, you know, being all that, that you can be when it comes to what God's called you to do on this earth. And then lastly, he says, your father's house. Get out of your father's house. See, what's interesting is that the Bible tells us that at some point, we do got to get out of the nest. Amen? Because if you never leave the nest, how are you ever going to fly? Right? And that's why I... I like the analogy of when you see the little birds in the nest and mama bird there with her, her baby birds that just hatched, right? They don't stay in that nest too long because mama has to go and get them their worms every day and feed them and take care of them. And uh, after a while, the little birdies have to learn how to do that on their own. Amen? Amen. And, and it's good to get on your own sometimes. It's good to go out there and spread your wings. Now, I know everybody's situation is different. You know, uh, I've, I've been reading a lot of different things about, they talk about this generation. And I think they call, what do they call this generation? Um, I can't think of the name. You know, they have terms for the different generations. Uh, am I, is it Generation X? Is that the one I'm, I'm thinking about? Or is it another one? I could be wrong. But when people who study the different generations of people throughout time, right, they talk about how now in this generation, more and more people are, are staying at home longer. People, you know, used to leave in their, you know, early 20s. Now they're not leaving home until their 30s because financially it's just too difficult to leave and I, and I get that 
And, and more and more, you know, families are living together to share cost. We see that even happening in churches. You see a lot of churches sharing buildings because it's more cost effective. And, and so I, I, I get that and I understand that, you know, if, you know, somebody's in that situation where, you know, financially they can't do it or maybe there's some, something else going on where, you know, they're looking after a elderly grandparent or something like that. I know everybody's situation is unique. But what I want you to see here this morning is as God is talking to Abraham, he's telling him to do A, B, and C. Get out of your country. Get away from your family and get out of your father's house. See, God, God has some instructions for Abraham. But see, what you need to understand is when, when God gives a set of instructions... You know, you need to understand is that God always has a plan and he has a purpose. Because if you go look in verse 2, he says, he says right here, I will make you a great nation. I will bless you. And I will make your name great. And you shall be a blessing. You see that? I'm going to let you in on a, on a little secret right here. Now you may be thinking... Oh, Abraham was probably, you know, he was probably about 25 when, he, when God told him this. Right? Go down to verse 4. So Abraham departed as the Lord had spoken to him, and Lot went with him. That was his nephew. And Abraham was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. Do you see that right there? So, in other words, you're never too old. And what I mean by that is this. See, God's got a plan for every one of us. And you're never too old to follow that plan that God has for you. Abraham was 75 years old. And from what the Bible teaches us is that he went on to live another 100 years. So what does that tell us? That he had 100 years to do so many great things for God. And he did. If you read Genesis, you'll see that Abraham did some great things for God. So, what separated Abraham from everyone else? Right? Because think about it. Why is it that, you know, God didn't, you know, reach out to somebody else? Why was it Abraham that God reached out to? Because the Bible tells us that Abraham was serving other gods. Well, hold your place there in Genesis, and let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 26, and, you know, Paul addresses this issue right here. So we're going over to 1 Corinthians chapter 26, and we're going to be in verse 31. Did I say 1 Corinthians 26? Uh-oh. Give me a second here. There's no chapter 26 in 1 Corinthians. Give me a second. That's what happens when you write notes quicker than uh, your mind is working. Give me a second. We'll get there in a second. Because what I want to show you is how Paul tells us something here. Give me a second. Too bad we don't have one of those game show music themes we can play right now. All right. Come on, Holy Spirit, help me here. Where are we at? Let's see here. I wrote down that wrong scripture. Okay, we're going to have to move on, and I'm going to get back to that in a, in a minute here. Let's go over to Romans chapter 10, verse 17. Right, right before Corinthians. Go to Romans... 10, 17. 
right before Corinthians. Here we go. Romans 10, 17. Right here the word says, So faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. You see that? Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So now, what was going on is that God spoke to Abraham. Remember we were in Genesis 12 and, and the, the word shows us that God spoke to Abraham and he told him, the Lord said to Abram, get out of your country, from your family, from your father's house to a land that I will show you and I will make you a great nation. I will bless you, make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. See, God spoke to Abraham and the word brought faith. Because that's what Romans ten seventeen tells us. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. See, Abraham was called to separate himself from the corruption that was around him. And he obeyed. See, that's what was going on right there. God told him to separate himself. See, sometimes that's what we have to do. We have to separate ourselves from those things that are around us. And unfortunately, we have an opportunity to be surrounded by a lot of bad things. You don't have to go very far. You don't even have to step out of your house to be influenced by those things. Because they're all around us. But God told Abraham, separate yourself. So in other words, God wanted him to get away from that. Now you've got to understand the times were different. There's a whole different time frame going on here. But the thing about Abraham is that he didn't question God. He just obeyed him and he did it. And that's where many of us fall short. That's where many of us get stuck. Is when God asks us to do something and we don't do it, we, we basically stop ourselves in our tracks right there. When it comes to the things of God. But who wouldn't want the promises that come with obeying God? Verse 2 of Genesis 12. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and I will make your name great and you shall be a blessing. Who wouldn't want that promise? Who would not want to receive that? I, I would want to receive that. And can you imagine Abraham saying, hey, I may not understand all this that's going on because you've got to understand he was living in an area where they were serving other gods. But then the Lord God spoke to him. And he says, I'm going to do it. And he obeyed him. Didn't question him. He did it. Because verse 4 tells us he departed. Now, <laughs> we've got to also understand that Abraham did not follow God's direction to the T. Right? He, he kind of compromised a little bit. And let me explain to you how he compromised. Because see, in verse number 1, what did God tell Abraham to do? He said, get out of your country and from your family. But here in verse 4, what does it say? He departed as God had spoken to him, and Lot went with him. Lot was his nephew, family. And if you read later on, we learn that even his father went with him as well. So Abraham did not follow the instructions exactly the way God had told him, but he did do what God told him. I think we can all relate to that, right? When God tells us to do something, we kind of want to tweak it a little bit, right? We want to add our little, own little flavor in there, or we want to kind of, you know, change it up a little bit when God has called us to do something. We're no different than Abraham, you know, because why? Because surrendering our will is not so easy. And you see right here, Abraham, the father of the faith, he took his nephew Lot with him. And we learn later on as you read Genesis that as Abraham's uh, family grew and his influence grew, and he had a lot of hired servants to help him look after all his livestock and everything. So did Lot. Lot's family grew. His influence grew. His servants, the number of his servants grew. And we find out later that Abraham and Lot finally got to a place where they were, you know, the, the area that they were in was getting too small for both of them. 
right? That's what ended up happening. And so, basically, it came to the point where Abraham had to tell Lot, hey, look, we, we need to kind of, you know, separate a little bit because their servants were even fighting with one another. They were kind of, you know, they were just, it was too close for comfort. And so Abraham tells Lot, you know what? Which, you pick which area you want to go. If you go to the east, I'll go to the west. Or if you go to the west, I'll go to the east. You choose and I'll go the opposite way. And they ended up having to do that because of the fact that they were starting to get on each other's nerves. They were kind of, you know, they outgrew their area, I guess you could say. So, maybe that wouldn't have happened if Abraham wouldn't have took Lot with him. And then we know later on that what ends up happening, where did Lot end up going? He ended up going to a place called Sodom and Gomorrah, a place that was not good at all. And what ended up happening is that Abraham had to help Lot out again, right? Because God was going to destroy that whole city with everyone in it. And Abraham knew his nephew Lot was down there, and so he had this discussion with God, basically trying to spare the life of his nephew. And he was able to do that. So sometimes when God asks us to do things, maybe it's best if we follow it to the letter. We'll save ourselves some problems down the road. Amen? See, in, in Genesis 12.2, when, when God, or excuse me, in Genesis 12, 1, when God tells him to get out of his country and his family and from his father's house, God didn't give Abraham any reasons or he didn't give him any explanations. But he simply gave him promises. See, God gave him promises. What I like about verse number 2 in Genesis 12 is when he tells Abraham, and you shall be a... A blessing. See, that's God's way of doing things. God blesses us that we would be a blessing. That's the whole reason why He blesses us. Why does God bless you with more than what you need? So I can put it away and save it for a rainy day. Well, yeah, God wants you to be prepared for a rainy day, but at the same time, God also wants you to be a blessing. See, we need to understand God's system of doing things. See, the world's system doesn't tell you to, you know, make sure that you're helping out, you know, the next guy. Or make sure that you're, you're helping out somebody along the way. Make sure that as you're coming up in all this success in what you do, make sure you help out somebody else. See, the, the world doesn't tell us that. The world tells us to look out for number one. The world tells us that that's all you need to look out for. But not in God's system. We see it here in Genesis 12 too. He wants us to be a blessing. See, that word blessing, if you were to look it up, it actually means empowered to prosper. Right? Empowered to prosper. So God wants us to be a blessing so therefore we can bless others. Why does the word tell us that he's given us an abundance for every good work? He's given us more than what we need so that we can be a blessing to others. And that's a concept that, that we as the church, we need to, we need to, to, to get that. Because that will hold us back from so many things. You know, and, and I just want to encourage you to know that regardless of where you may stand financially, because trust me, everyone here, you know, deals with finances. Some people deal with finances better than others. Sometimes, you know, when we're dealing with finances and maybe there's a, you know, there's a, a shortage or, or maybe, you know, finances aren't there. We think that the answer to our solution is more money. We think the answer is, well, Lord, if I, if I had more money, I'll, I can get out of that situation. I can get out of that, that hole. 
See, more money may not be the answer to the problem. See, what the answer to the problem is, is having the wisdom to be the, a good steward of the resources that God has given you. So, more money is not necessarily the answer. Now, we may think that that's the answer because that's all we could see. Well, if I had more, I can get out of this situation or I can take care of this situation. But we're not looking at it from a perspective of the resources that I've had, did I manage them well? Was I a good steward of those resources? Right? See, the thing is this, is that when it comes to finances, right, you have to understand that first and foremost, if you want to be part of God's system, and God's system is called tithing and offerings, right? We've learned that in the book of Malachi chapter 3 when it tells us, will a man rob God? Right? Let's, let's, let's go there. I know we're getting a little bit off track, but I, I want to help somebody this morning because this helped me. Amen? Malachi chapter 3, right before the book of Matthew here in the New Testament. Last book in the Old Testament. Malachi chapter 3. And let's go to verse number 8. Malachi 3.8. Look at what it says. Will a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me. But you say, in, in what way have we robbed you? In tithes and offerings. Verse 9. You are cursed with a curse, for you have robbed me, even this whole nation. Verse 10. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. And look at this. The only time in the Bible that God says to try him. And try me now in this, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it. And then he goes on to say, and I will rebuke the devourer for your sake. Who is the devourer? The enemy, right? I will rebuke the devourer. What does that mean? I will rebuke the devourer. In other words... That word rebuke means to correct, right? And the devourer is the enemy, right? He comes to what? What does the enemy come to do? Steal, kill, and destroy, right? So in other words, when you have, you know, your, your goods and things that you've paid for, don't you want them to last? Who likes to buy something and have it, you know, expire or stop working before the expiration date, right? Right? Nobody likes that, right? Because the first thing you're going to do is you're going to get on the phone and you're going to call that company, right, and say, hey, I got my receipt here. And the warranty says you're going to replace it or you're going to fix it before this expiration date. See, everybody wants what they buy to last them. And what the Word of God is telling us here is that when we become, when we are in God's system, his financial system of tithing and offering, what ends up happening is now you have this warranty protection plan, you could call it, and that means that he's going to rebuke the devourer, so that means your goods are going to last you. That means he's got to look after you and your stuff because you are now in his system of doing things. This is a, a biblical principle here. And see, there's so many benefits that come with getting into God's system of doing things, right? And, and I wanted to share that with you this morning because too often we as people, we think the answer is more money. And that's not necessarily the case. The answer is having the wisdom to be a good steward of what God has given you. To be able to manage it better. That's what it's all about, right? Because, see, the thing is this, is that when you're in God's system, when you're giving tithes and offerings, right, now God has to work in your finances. 
And what's interesting about it is that God does not need your money. The Bible says he owns the cattle on a thousand hills. I mean, think about it. It was God who deposited all the gold and diamonds in the earth and the oil and all these natural resources. God does not need anything from us, but what God does is he creates a, a way to help us. Tithing and offering is a way to help us. But uh, too often we, we overlook God's ways of doing things and we want to do things our way. And when you do things your way, sure, they will get you a certain result, but nothing can ever compare to God's results. Amen? And, and that's what I wanted to just share with you this morning about that because you need to look at finances as a tool. You need to look at it as the, your resources as a tool. To, it's, it's a tool to do things. It's not the answer to your problems. You know, praying for wisdom to be a better steward of the resources God has given you is a better approach in looking at those situations when it comes to finances. And like I said, I know we got off topic there, but I just had to share that with you because too often we miss it because of our lack of knowledge. The Bible says in Hosea, I think it's Hosea, my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. Right? In other words, we, we make bad decisions because we don't have the knowledge to make the good decisions. We go based off of what we know. And unfortunately, what we know is not good enough. And that's why we got to get back to doing things God's way. Amen? And that's why we're talking about here this morning, Genesis chapter 12, how God says that He will make us a blessing. You shall be a blessing. Now I know He gave these words to Abraham, but they're applicable to us today. See, the whole theme, I guess you can say, and what we're studying here in Genesis 12.1 is obedience brings blessing. That's what happens. Obedience brings blessings. As we are willing to do what God says to do, the blessing will come. And that's what I want to reiterate to you this morning, this afternoon. You know, and as I was saying earlier, Abraham didn't even fully obey. He took his father and he took his nephew Lot with him. See, whenever you bring or whatever you bring with you from the old life into the new life, it can create problems. Did you guys get that? See, God was taking Abraham from this way of life that wasn't good for him. Right? He was telling him to separate himself from the area that he was at and the people he was around because it wasn't good for him. And he was going to take him to another place and to have a better life is what it was all about. And Abraham, what did he do? He brought his father and his nephew with him and God told him, leave your family. But the thing is this, is that when God takes us from the old life to the new life, right, and, and, and we want to bring those things with us to this new life, it can create problems. Let me kind of, kind of connect the dots here for you. See, when you start your relationship with God, right, now you have this, this new spiritual life going on. And although that when you have this relationship, you know, through Christ Jesus, you know, you're, you're learning and you're growing, unfortunately, that thing that you have on your shoulders, your, above your neck, called your brain here, right, it thinks a certain way. And even though you, you know, you've opened your heart to, to God and you want to learn more about Him and you want to connect to Him, you still have this old way of thinking Right? And unfortunately, you want to bring some of the old way of thinking into this new life and this new relationship that you have with God. And yet God is trying to help you change the way you think. But yet you're fighting Him tooth and nail because you don't want to give up your old ways. But yet it's those old ways that 
got you to the place that you were at. And see, so God wants to help you renew your mind, as Paul tells us, to change the way you think so that you can start thinking better and start getting better results. See, but we have to stop fighting God on letting go. So many of us refuse to change. And we'll even, you know, quote those old sayings, ah, you can't teach an old dog new tricks. So that's like, we're, we're, we're saying that, we're giving ourselves an excuse, I guess you could say. Because we're set in our ways. And we've done it this way for so long that, well, I just can't, I can't change. Yes, you can change. How many times in the Bible have we seen God move in people's lives and they were already up there in age? We just looked at Abraham. He was 75 years old when God told him to leave, to, to go somewhere else and to do something different because what he was doing was not working. He was 75 years old. Moses was 80. Noah was 120. So, yes... You can be up there in age and have been doing something for so long, but the point of it is, is that you have to be willing to change if you want to start seeing different results. Amen? Remember, obedience brings blessing. Obedience. See, the thing about it is this, is that Abraham was learning about faith. See, faith is, 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 I guess you can say it's blind, because the Bible tells us faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. That's Hebrews 11.1. 1. So faith, in other words, is believing in something you can't see. That's faith, right? Believing in something you can't see. The easiest way I can explain it to you is when it comes to the cross, we never seen Jesus die on that cross. We weren't around 2,000 years ago. But yet we believed he died on that cross. Right? We believe it. That's called faith because we're believing in something we didn't see. Right? Now, how did we get to a place to believe in something we didn't see? Well, just like Abraham here in, in 12.1 when God spoke to him. Right? The Bible tells us, I showed you in Romans 10.17, that you know, the word comes from hearing, right? Faith comes from hearing and hearing by the word, right? That's how we, we build our faith up, by hearing the word of God. See, so God spoke to Abraham, he heard God's word, and it built up his faith to follow God's instructions. So faith is very key. See, so the thing is this. Why does God test us, right? Well, he tests us in order to build our faith and bring out the best in us. I know sometimes we don't understand those things when we're going through something that's bigger than ourselves. But see, you need to understand that God wants to bring out the best in you. Now, the devil, he tempts you in order to destroy your faith and bring out the worst in you. See, so remember when you walk by faith, you're, you're leaning on, on God alone. That's what you're doing when you're walking by faith. You're leaning on God and Him alone. Because faith, as I mentioned to you, is, is blind. And as we look here at Abraham, that's what he was doing. He was leaning on God. Because could you imagine being in Abraham's shoes? And God's saying to you, get out of your country, from your family, from your father's house, and to a land I will show you. He couldn't turn around and say, where's my phone? I've got to Google this. What is God saying? You know, these days we have answers for everything, right? We have a question, what do we do? We Google it, or whatever your you know, favorite way of looking something up is. We have everything at our fingertips, the World Wide Web. You don't even have to go to a library no more. You don't even have to crack open a book. It's right there. Right? Abraham didn't have technology. He didn't have any of that kind of stuff. Matter of fact, he couldn't even get on a phone and call a cousin or a friend and say, hey, what, what does all this mean? He couldn't text anybody. 
All Abraham could do was either listen to God and follow his instructions or just do his own thing. But see, as God spoke to Abraham, something happened. And that's what I, I want you to see is that as we hear God's word, it produces faith in our life. Now here we're looking at Abraham right in a period of his life where he was not serving God. Because we've seen that in Joshua chapter 24 verse 2. It says he was serving other gods. And so we see Abraham at a period in his life where he wasn't serving God. But yet, God spoke to him, and when he heard God's words, it gave him faith. Isn't that so awesome? See, our God is, a, is an awesome God, amen? And, and that's why we spend time in the Word, so that it can activate faith bigger in our lives. See, because without faith, we would never, you know, be prompted to reach for more, or how should I put it, we, sh we wouldn't reach for, you know, the, you know, higher. We wouldn't reach for, try to tap into the supernatural, cause, because it takes faith to believe and understand those kinds of things. We would just continue to operate in the natural. But see, God's word will increase your faith. And you can be like Abraham. You can be a blessing. That's what God wants to do in your life. He wants to make you a blessing. Amen? So as we wind down this morning, I know we kind of were a little bit all over the place, but what you need to understand is when we study Father Abraham, you know, he, like I said, he's the father of the faith. It was through Abraham, through his seed, that we get the nation of Israel. And it was through Abraham that we learned so much about faith. And there's so much to learn about Abraham because he is uh, someone who God used to show us so much. But yet at the same time, he was no different than you and I. He wasn't always the father of the faith. He wasn't always a friend of God. But see, he was willing and obedient to follow God. And that's what it takes. That's what it takes to go to that other level, is to be willing to follow God, to be willing and obedient. And as Isaiah says in chapter 1, verse 19, if you are willing and obedient, you will eat the good of the land. Amen? So I want to encourage you this morning to know that obedience, to be willing to say yes to God, to be willing to follow His instruction is going to bring you blessings. Obedience brings promises. Because I know oftentimes we, we don't want to, you know, do something or, or anything that somebody tells us to do. But the thing is this, is that we got to we got to let that go. And we got to know that when it comes to God, and when He's asking us to do something, then it comes with promise. And so I just want to encourage you this morning to know that if God is asking you to change something in your life, maybe it might not be as drastic as what He did with Abraham when He told him to leave his country or to leave his family, right? Or to leave his father's house. You know, it may not be so drastic as those things, but if God is asking you to leave something, it's for your own good. See, God wants to take you out of those situations that may not be good for you. And sometimes you've got to be willing to just cut those ties and, and get away. Trust God. Amen? If I can ask everyone to stand this morning as we get ready to close... We serve a good God. Amen? See, Abraham was willing to follow what God had said. And God said, I'm going to make you a father of many nations. That's what God told Abraham. 
He says in verse 2, I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and I will make your name great and you shall be a blessing. Look at verse 3. And I will bless those who bless you and I will curse him who curses you. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. This is why we support the nation of Israel. Because of what God shares with us. Not just here, but also in other places in Scripture, it tells us about being a friend of Israel. And if you don't know that or never heard that, I encourage you to study the Word, because it tells us a friend of Israel is a friend of God, an enemy of Israel is an enemy of God. God loves Israel. And so we pray for them and we support them. Amen? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you in the name of Jesus. And Lord, we lift you up. We thank you for your word. We pray that it was sown on good ground. Oh Lord, we pray, Father, that, that we would have faith like Abraham. That you could give us an instruction and we wouldn't even question it. We would just, we would just follow it. Father, we, we pray that we could just have a faith like Abraham. To do your will, Lord. Lord, help us to be a people of faith that would not question you, but just follow you, Lord. Oh, Father, I thank you this morning for your people. I speak blessings on them in the name of Jesus, and I call them blessed. Oh, Father, we give you glory and honor in the precious name of Jesus. And everyone says, Amen.